Hello and welcome to today's webinar. This is the first SDL World Server Quarterly Showcase for 2019. My name's Kate and I'm your host. We expect that today's webinar will last about 35 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. I'm now going to pass you over to Ray and Bart to introduce themselves. Thank you very much, Kate. Welcome, everybody. Um, Typically, if you've joined these uh, showcase webinars in the past, you'll have uh, heard my voice from most of the presentation. But today, uh, I am the guest speaker, so I'll have a small slot at the end. And I'm going to hand over to Bart now, who's going to do the main presentation. Over to you, Bart. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Ray. Um, my name is Bart Mączyński. I'm a director of business consulting at SDL. Today, we are going to talk about terminology management in World Server. I will start with a few slides um, to set the stage, and then I'll show you a few um, tips and tricks in World Server itself. Um, after we uh, finish the demo, Ray will have a few messages uh, regarding the roadmap for the World Server product. Now, um, many global enterprises have a pretty robust multilingual content management practice, and a lot of experience um, is developed in an enterprise around day-to-day -day translation management processes. However, terminology management is often an afterthought. Um, it's not always perceived to be the most important, and as a result, um, it's not always done in the most optimal or consistent fashion. Uh, you probably are all familiar with the common approach where you use um, spreadsheets in Excel and you share them, or maybe documents, and um, therefore, the, the practice of terminology management is considered difficult. Um, however, it doesn't have to be that way, and uh, most definitely it shouldn't, considering the fact that terminology is the building block of your content, and for many brands, it's a unique differentiator. So today we're going to uh, talk a little bit about the value of terminology, then we'll uh, look at how terminology works in uh, World Server and how we can create entries, approve them, um, and automate the work. Uh, and finally, we'll look into how terminology surfaces in translation projects. Um, now, terminology can make your messaging successful. It can also lead to confusion and um, sometimes unintended humor, as in this sign here. A lack of clear, precise, and consistent terminology leads to a variety of issues, and that may involve higher costs of translation, higher cost of review, of QA, um, ramp up in customer support cases, uh, sometimes issues with regulatory compliance, um, or even more dangerous things like patient safety. So let's look at a, a few examples on uh, how um, it is easy to make terminology mistakes. Now, for this, um, I chose examples from a specific industry because um, it's um, easy to, um, to counter-argue um, that, you know, if you have an, a classic example, let's say server, may mean a server computer or it may mean um, a waiter in a restaurant if you're in the U.S., uh, should be therefore translated in two different ways. Well, these are two different domains. These are two different verticals. Nobody would ever make a mistake like that. Um, that's a valid point. However, even in the same vertical, and I chose life sciences here, you'll see that the same um, um, the same word may uh, may mean multiple things, and therefore should be considered a separate term. So, discharge um, a noun. In this sentence, hearing loss accompanied by ear pain, pressure, or a discharge is usually a symptom of infection. This means some kind of secretion, really nasty thing going on. Um, that's one word that um, life sciences professionals, health authorities, and so on might be describing this situation. Well, the same word, um, when we talk about um, cardiology and the function of the heart, um, we talk that it may be. Um, uh, the, that it's initiated, the heartbeat is initiated by electrical discharge. Well, in this case, it's an impulse. It's an electrical impulse and has nothing to do with the first meaning of that word. Um, and then uh, finally, um, if 
you are a patient at a hospital or other healthcare facility and um, you are discharged. So the discharge report uh, may refer to this um, this particular event as well. So it's a release of the patient and the patient information. So as you see, these are three different meanings, uh, three different concepts really, um, and therefore um, should be treated um, um, as separate entries potentially in a terminology database. Um, let's have a look at another quick example. So let's say that um, somewhere on a label or instruction for use uh, for um, chemical entity, a, a, a drug, a medicine, uh, we read uh, that it should be administered bi-weekly. Okay, so you may not know what that means or not be sure. You want some help from a dictionary, you go to a dictionary, and it's not much more help either, because bi-weekly may mean either every two weeks, all right, or twice a week. So you are likely to get four times too many pills, or um, too few, if you are unlucky. Um, and also, if you translate that into another language, for example, my native Polish, you would have to select completely different meanings because every two weeks is so dwa tygodnie and occurring twice a week is dwa razy na tydzień. So obviously some care has to be um, um, invested into managing this term and um, those two terms, in fact, those two meanings. Now, the way we do that, um, to, to the way we try to remove any kind of um, conflation from um, similar sounding or um, uh, similar sounding terms is by using an entry model for our terminology that is based on the concept rather than the term. So the concept corresponds to the entry or entry corresponds to the, the concept. Think of it as a, the, the sort of abstract meaning of that particular um, concept is what those different terms describe. This also means that we have the following features available to us. We can specify metadata, descriptive information that is relevant to the whole concept, and then uh, metadata that's relevant to the particular term. For example, if you have a term power cord and power cable, they are equivalent, they are synonyms, they will be in the same entry but one of them may be preferred in your documentation and the other may be perhaps something you see sometimes but you don't really want to use. Also, what it allows us to do is have our um, terminology organized in multilingual fashion because since we are all pivoting on the same concept, it doesn't really matter what was our source term. Um, to begin with. So we could go in reverse and translate, say, from Spanish, German, Polish, Japanese into English with the same success. All right. So let's have a look in, at how this all fits together in World Server. And I'm going to share my screen with you to illustrate some of these ideas. All right, you should be able to see my screen. All right, so the first thing to know is that World Server, um, in addition to being a great translation management system, has a lot of those linguistic functions built in. Everybody is familiar with the translation memory. We also have terminology management module and that terminology management module creates um, and maintains objects that we call terminology databases or TDs. You can maintain as many of them as you want and I'm going to show you one of them. So I go to tools, 
CERN databases or CDs. And I pick one of my terminology databases. And when I click on Browse, I can see all the entries in this terminology database as I switch to all terms. You can see that they are organized um, by language. And I also have some additional um, metadata here. I have an image illustrating what a hard drive is. And I have some definitions for the network adapter. You also see that in this case, network adapter, for example, and network interface card are synonymous. And they are in the same um, entry. And I can actually click on that and display the entry in its entirety. And you can also see that I have a definition, which is on the entry level. And at the bottom, I have three different terms. Two of them are English, and one of them is Polish. And you can see that as I switch between them, the term label here at the top or in the middle of the entry card switches as well. Um, now, in addition to this, I can also search uh, for entries um, or terms of, of particular interest. So um, we have a simple search. For example, I could search for screen. And it just gives me the screen and screen savers in this case. I also can do advanced search if I wanted to search for particular um, text within some other field than the term itself. So let's say, show me any entry that in its uh, definition, let's say, matches, um, let's say, component. And when I click my search, I can see that um, all of these, um, those two entries have the word component in its definition. Uh, of course, the, you can save those filters for later if this is the kind of search that you do all the time and so on. Um, you can also add entries here. Um, and we make a distinction between adding and um, proposing entry changes. If you are a terminologist or administrator and you're authorized to do the add part, you can add the entry here. Um, let's say I want to add the entry for um, battery. And I'm going to switch it to active because I want it to be available once, uh, once I create it. And it's general. Now you see, um, I'm using here different uh, predefined fields to describe this particular um, term and entry. So um, once I created this entry and do my search again, you can see battery has been added. I actually have a previous entry where battery was added as well. And it has a German translation as Akku or accumulator. This probably, since this is a rechargeable battery, this is probably a non-rechargeable battery. So if I wanted to modify this, I'd like to add a definition or some other description to make a distinction between those. Now, where do those descriptive fields come from? In the World Server, under Management and Administration, we have a customization section that allows us to change attributes. And you can see that those attributes here are uh, that I have listed are either on the TD term, or terminology database term, or ent entry level. So um, here, for example, the category is defined in such a way that I can select whether the term is an abbreviation, a full form, acronym, and so on. You can design your own um, uh, your own attributes. Um, to fit your terminology databases. And then multiple terminology databases may even end up using different types of attributes because they may be dedicated to a specific purpose. Um, so, all right, that was manipulation of a 
ready term base um, or terminology database, um, how do we create them? Um, you can go to management again and linguistic tool setup. Now the thing you've noticed is that a different section of the interface is dedicated to working with the terminology content once the TD is created. And yet another section is used uh, for creating terminology databases. That's because in World Server, we make a distinction who may be able to do one versus the other. You may have terminologists working on the content, but administrators setting up the terminology database. Now, my user can do both of those things, so I don't have to switch between users. So let's go to the term database setup, and let's add a new term database. Let's call it Webinar TD. There are a few things that are quite interesting here. So first is an attribute mask. What that means is simply which of the fields that are available as descriptive fields, as metadata fields for my terms and my entries should be included in this TD when I create it. Well, I'm going to take all of them because I like them. There is also access control. Um, this is if you wanted to restrict access because you have some secrets in your terminology database. For example, you have information about yet unreleased product that is going to only go to a narrow group of people that work on your future marketing campaign. But I'm not going to do that right now. I'm just going to create my webinar TD as is. Now, once this webinar TD has been created, um, it will show up here under Term Databases in Tools. And here it is. And of course, as you can see, it is empty. Now, of course, we already know how to add entries to the terminology database. You can say, again, it's, um, let's say, general idea, and um, I don't know, I want to define a USB a cable. And um, it is an active entry, and I'm going just to save it. All right, so now if I browse, I have USB cable added here as well. Now, this is um, a method that I can use when I have a single item or several items to add, and I, I have the authority to actually change what's available in this um, terminology database because I'm an administrator or terminologist or anyone um, with permissions to do so. But what if I were just a regular translator? Would I have access to it? Well, you can set up access of regular translators to that same term base as well. I'm going to use a different user Tanya, who is a translator, not a terminologist, but she still has uh, useful suggestions, and we want to capture those. We can capture those um, in the same terminology database, but we don't give Tanya an option to add an entry because we still want to go through this approval process. Instead, we uh, give her the uh, option to propose entries. So she is um, obliged to put in some comment about the proposal. Um, we need this term in case of emergency. And um, this is just a general term. And the term she has in mind is escape hatch. All right. So now she can save the entry. And as you can see, this entry has been added with a different icon than the one um, that was uh, added directly by, um, by our administrator. This entry is proposed, which means it will not show up in any translation project. It has to be validated first. Now, in some cases, um, your community of users may have ideas not only about um, new entries to be added, but also changes that should be included or, or that should modify our existing entries. So, for example, in this case, we have 
a valid term, USB cable. But um, let's say Tanya wants to add some precision to this and say, which type of USB cable are we talking about? And say, more precise term would be USB-A cable, which is still um, in use, even though it's a bit of an old standard. And she would propose that change. And as she proposes this change, the entry history would be adjusted and the term history as well. And now we can see that our user has made this proposal and changed this um, USB cable. I'll have to save this first. And that um, change history travels with the entry throughout its whole life cycle. So we can see all the changes that everybody is contributing, proposing, approving or rejecting inside the entry. All right. So now we know how to add entries and how to um, propose entries. Um, and we could um, we could keep on doing it, uh, but it's a pretty manual process. So what if I already have um, a list of terms that I want to include in my term base? Well, for that, we can do an import. So in order to do an import, we are going to log out and go back as our terminologist slash administrator because she has the permission to do it. And she's going to go back into the same term database, the webinar TD. Um, you can see she can right away see that there was um, some proposed entry here. There's a proposal, proposal comment from the previous user, which is great. But she now wants to import a bunch of stuff um, and populate the term base terminology database in uh, batch fashion. So let me um, first show you what I'm going to import. So um, I have this very simple, relatively unstructured um, spreadsheet. It has some um, English terms, uh, Polish translations, bunch of definitions, some notes for Polish specifically, and the field that tells me where this entry came from, who conceived of this, or where, where I found it. Now, um, in order to import this, I saved this as a um, text file separated by tabs. So each field is a separate tab. I can show you what this file looks like. Now, there are other options to save this as. Um, you could save it as comma uh, delimited file, but um, saving as text allows us to save it with uh, the encoding that will allow us to have any scripts and any uh, languages in the same entry. So let's see how we could import that. Now, the, this is not a terminology exchange format. This is um, just a simple, um, simple file. So what we need to do, and the most important thing, will be to map up the columns from this Excel spreadsheet to the fields we know we have available in our terminology database. Fortunately, World Server will do most of the work for us. So I go to import TD. I say I want a delimited file. I look for my simple TXT file. Um, I switch the field delimiter to tab. And I'll import everything as proposed. Now, in the next step already, the system is saying, hey, I found the following data, the source, the English-Polish definition notes. Does this look right to you? Yes, it does. And then this is where the mapping happens. So it says, OK, the column that's called source, the system thinks it should be the entry attribute called source, and the English should be English, the Polish should be Polish. So it's figured out by the name of the column it inferred the structure of this spreadsheet, but it did not find, um, did not figure out what to do with nodes, perhaps because nodes are available on multiple levels in my term base. So I'm going to say, you know what, nodes is really a term attribute, and I only want this for 
Polish. And the name of this attribute is notes. And I run my import. And the import has completed. And as you can see, it was successful. I have a bunch of new stuff um, inside. Um, I can actually change the view here. I can um, pick the source as well so that I know where this where those entries came from okay so what we've done here we have created or, or run um, a batch import and um, we have populated our terminology database with a whole lot of content in one go which is great but you've noticed that when we were importing this, um, all of our entries um, have terms that were imported with this proposed status. Now, I could have selected the uh, approved and active status during import, but um, maybe I was not sure about the quality of this terminology, and I have a process in place to validate this terminology using my subject matter experts and terminologists. So these entries and terms have to be validated first. Um, and there are a few ways to do it. First of all, you can uh, switch your view to either entries that themselves are proposed, so the proposed terms, or that are active but have proposed changes. Aha, uh -huh. that is the one that the, where, where our uh, colleague Tanya proposed the change to make it USB-A cable. All right. So let's look at those proposed terms. Um, I could pick a term, let's say button. I could review it. I could edit it if I am a terminologist. And I say, you know what? It's great. I can activate just one of these um, languages or terms. Or I could activate all the proposed terms if I'm um, uh, if if this is what my job is. That is, if I can understand the source and target in this case. Um, so that's great. Um, I could I can I can do that. And as you now see, if I show all terms, button has a green uh, check next to it. It's all been proposed, uh, uh, it's all been um, validated, and it's fine. Now, I could again do all of this manually. I could even uh, tell my colleagues that are um, German, Spanish, and Russian validators to log on, um, look for unvalidated stuff and proposed stuff and validated, activated. But um, I don't really want to do that sorry, because. Bob, um, to that, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Would you mind sharing your screen again? Because we just got the PowerPoint. We can't actually see the demo in progress anymore. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, was it? I hope it was a recent occurrence. Uh, yes, about a minute or so ago, we lost the sharing. Okay, what happened? It looks like I got kicked out of Bright Talk. Let me very quickly go back to it. Uh, maybe not. It says, okay. All right. Sorry about that. Application. back in business so I can see a world over login screen. Perfect. All right. Here we go. So um, you did see the import, right? Yes, we did. And the yeah. mapping okay. and that, yeah. Okay, perfect. So this is the result of the import. And the point I was making um, was that I could validate these um, entries one by one, but that would be a lot of work. Um, I instead want to run a validation project. So what I'm going to do is click Validate TD. 
And um, what I can do is validate a um, the, the run the um, two workflows that that we have prepared to show you. So uh, first one is um, manual term validation, and the second is automated uh, validation. Now the um, manual validation it simply will create a um, project, a terminology project, will send a notification to our group of terminologists, and will ask them to um, go into each entry and um, do their work. So let's, um, let's call it manual, manual validation. And I'll assign it to my group of terminologists, and I can do entry validation. So I want them to have a look at the definitions and all of that. And one project was created. Now the best way to look at what it looks like is here under assignments and projects. And you can see manual validation was created. And here I have a list of all the TD entries that need to be validated. Um, and I can go directly to the entry and decide what to do with it. Activate all proposed terms, modify it. Um, if I am the, um, the person responsible for making the decision whether a certain entry makes sense in the context of this, um, of this terminology database. So you could do that that way. But in many cases, you have a slightly different situation. You have the source terms that need to be translated and then uh, the translations need to be approved. So, to achieve that, you can um, run a term validation project. And in this case, I'm going to show you a term validation project that is automatic. So let's go back to our terminology database. Click Validate TD. Automatic validation. same team of terminologists. Um, and then I select all of my languages in the term base. And my um, workflow roles for my terminologists would be set up in such a way that my um, German subject matter experts get German validation terms, and Polish get Polish, and Russian gets Russian, and so on and so forth. But here we keep it very simple. So if I go back, to my um, assignments and have a look at the projects. You can see that automatic validation was created for both English and Polish in this case. So if you have a look at that, um, you can see that um, th this looks very similar. And by the way, the mechanism of terminology projects is very useful because it gives us all of the um, um, adjacent function functionality that comes with running a translation project. So automatic email notification, we can track what happened to the asset in the project. Um, we can set up who's responsible. For example, here we, we see that in addition to the whole team of terminology validators, we assign this to Tina, uh, the, the terminologist. But in this workflow, and I'm going to show you the workflow, rather than um, switch the status of each term individually, I can batch validate them. And this is our new workflow editor um, view, and this is something that Ray will mention later today. But in this particular workflow, when I complete my step, I can actually do a batch validation of several um, terminology entries uh, or terms in this case at the same time. So it has predetermined statuses. This is choose this if you wanted to approve it, choose this if you want to have it preferred, and this if you want to reject it, and so on. So let's say I'm ready to validate everything that's about keyboards and keys. I click complete, set approved, and this will automatically queue this for the automatic um, application of this status. Um, on, in a batch fashion, if I quickly um, 
refresh my screen, you can see that this step succeeded. The workflow for these three items has completed. And now we have three validated terms um, for this particular language. Okay, so so this this is great. Um, and um, this um, is a way of um, running ter a terminology practice in a semi-automated fashion. But there's one more way in which we can further automate this um, terminology validation. And this could be done also for terminology um, translation. We have in World Server a component called um, business rules. So if I go to business rules linkage and click on rules, you can see that I have um, a bunch of um, of rules created here. Business rules are a mechanism that um, is not um, like running a project. Instead, it is testing for certain properties and statuses and states in various objects and repositories within the system. So you could use business rules for things like um, show me all tasks that are overdue, or in this case, show me all um, all uh, terminology um, entries that require um, review and, and need to be validated. So these rules um, are programmatic statements that don't require uh, the knowledge of programming. Basically, you select your conditions here, and the green statements are your parameters or variables. So I'm going to look um, for a statement for um, terms in a particular database. In this case, I'll switch to my webinar TDE. And um, for Polish, with validation status proposed, validation project called approved proposed terms assigned to this team will follow the automated workflow. And um, the nice thing about those rules is that you can actually uh, decide how this rule should run. Um, you could set it to run on a particular schedule, and uh, the schedule could be, say, recurrence of every week or every day or some other some other schedule that is custom. Uh, I'm going to set it to manual so that I can execute it now on my own uh, to show you during the webinar. So once the rule is saved, I can executed. Now imagine that instead of me executing it, every Friday morning the rule runs happily to produce a crop of terms that need to be validated. This is the delta that we collected uh, from the community of translators and other people that propose changes throughout the whole week. So once this uh, rule executes, the rule will automatically create new projects that I again um, see in assignments. You can see approved proposed terms. Again, these are the these are the um, the terms that need to be approved. So this is a way of further automating this work um, within your organization using World Server. All right. Um, so this is all great. Now how does this fit into the translation projects? Well, this is quite simple because once you have your terminology um, imported, approved, validated, translated, and so on, you can reference your terminology databases in your project. So you go to business rule linkage, you go to your project types, and you pick any of the projects project types you want to change this for and under linguistic tools you can see that terminology database can be switched to any of the terminology databases there is a little bit more to it because we could also make exceptions for certain uh, target locales if you have terminology that's only relevant for a given region uh, we can also group terminology databases in those virtual sequences that will allow us to reuse from more than one terminology database at a time. And that's something we do with translation memories as well. So once this is done, 
you can actually see what it looks like in a translation environment. So um, there are two ways in which terminology um, um, can be um, can be added depending on the um, editor in which you're doing your translation. So first I'm going to show you a translation project with a simple HTML document um, being translated into Polish and I'll open it in browser workbench. Yeah. I should uh, have switched to uh, to being a translator. The system has told me that I'm not allowed to do this translation. So let me right. All right. So this translator now is going to open this in browser workbench. And you can see that next to um, the segments here, I have a little book icon. And that means that terminology database entries are available. Now, there's no, termin no translation memory match for this segment, but there is a terminology database match right here. You can see that control panel is panel sterowania. And um, what I could do, I could just type it if I wanted to, or I can start writing my sentence. And just click this insert button. And the term translation will be automatically inserted. Now this person, our translator, has also access to a broader view of this particular entry that you know well already from um, when we were playing around with setting up our terminology database. And it is also uh, where she could, if she wanted to, uh, propose entry change, either for the source or the translation term, or perhaps for the definition or some other descriptor in the entry. So that's one way how this works. But if you work with um, offline resources, if you use um, SDL Trado Studio on the desktop, you use translation packages. And the great thing is that World Server will package not only the uh, bilingual file that needs to be translated and not, uh, not only the subset of the translation memory that's relevant, but also the terminology database. And that terminology database will surface in Studio automatically. You don't have to do anything special. The same project um, here as uh, manifested as a project package in Studio. You can see that there is no translation memory match, but I have this control panel shows me which terminology database it's coming from. It's the TD, uh, EGA TD. Um, and again, I can start typing. And it, what's great in Studio, Studio is predicting that you are going to want to use this um, term here. So you don't have to spell it out completely. It will automatically insert it for you. Um, it also allows you to uh, view the bigger picture here, more of the of this particular entry. Um, and uh, the uh, let's, let, let me refresh this. Right. The, I'm just too quick with the mouse. Right here, you can see that most um, the, the view is uh, familiar already, that um, we see both the source and target. Mm, we see the nodes. We see the definition. Um, so all the metadata fields have been preserved as well. OK. So this is broadly how terminology can be maintained, created, translated, and validated in World Server and also how it can be referenced in translation projects that are translated both within World Server and outsourced to studio users. Um, and that concludes my part of the demo. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Bart. That was uh, very interesting and very detailed, uh, very thorough. Um, whilst people are busy typing their questions, I'm just going to jump in. Um, 
uh, move the slides forward and just give people a quick roadmap summary. So uh, the next release, which is 11.4, uh, Bart touched upon the fact that there's a new workflow editor component in there, the applet free version, thankfully. Um, so that's coming in 11.4 uh, at the end of Q1. Uh, we're just uh, wrapping up the engineering phase there and moving into regression, so we're ready to ship that. Uh, and many other improvements uh, with that particular version, the UI performance and some significant UI performance improvements. There uh, is a new single sign-on framework, and uh, we've been extending the REST API. There's a full SDK now. That's all online, actually, already in docs.sdl.com. And there's an updated studio uh, plugin for the live connectivity uh, this is actually pending the next studio release, so that's world server interaction, but the release vehicle for that is uh, that will be the next uh, Trado studio release. And later in the, in the summer, we will have an 11.5, very relevant uh, to the discussion, um, well, the presentation that Bart was just giving related to terminology. In our new online editor, we will be having terminology matches from world server TTs available in that release as well, so that's uh, a couple of months away, but that's uh, work in progress right now. Business Rules Wizard, that's the, the last of the applets that we'll be replacing. Um, some significant work there again to replicate all of that business logic in a new UI component. That's progressing nicely also. And the final uh, theme really for the 11.5 release will be uh, enhancing the daily life of our project manager persona, so improved user experience some new functionality, and some nice dashboarding for uh, visual project status. So that's the next two releases. And for some of you, you may have received this an email already. Uh, I have a publicly available demo server with a pre-release build of 11.4 if you want to play around with that new online editor or any other uh, aspect. Um, the workflow editor and online editors is there as well with some UX improvements. Um, if you haven't received an email uh, asking you to register with this, please do feel free to reach out to me directly or hopefully at sdl.com and I can add you to the list. For those who have registered, I will be sending out the details of that server URL and credentials uh, tomorrow. So that's all from me. Great, thanks Bart and Ray for presenting today. If you do have any questions, can you um, please pop them in the um, Ask the Question tab um, in the box there and we'll be sure to come, um, come through to them. It seems, Bart, that you've managed to explain everything so comprehensively that uh, nobody's got a question for you at this point. i leave that with other comments, Ray. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, and um, I guess if you have any questions about this, um, um, about terminology management or world server, in particular, um, you know the ways in which we can be reached. And um, I do encourage you to have a look at um, the, the sneak peek, um, the preview of 11.4. I myself found it a very good release, and I actually decided to use it already for this presentation. Great. Thanks, everybody, and thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, a recording will be available here on Bright Talk straight after the webinar, um, but we'll also send a copy of, um, of the recording to everyone who's registered, so if you want to watch it again. Uh, we hope you found today's session useful, and we look forward to seeing you again on one of our next webinars. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everybody.